The Life and Sad Ending of Little Richard Little Richard was born Richard Wayne Penniman in Macon, Georgia on December 5, 1932, the third of twelve children. His mother was deeply religious and regularly attended a Baptist church where his father was a deacon. Richard's father was also a brick mason and a bootlegger who ran a honky-tonk on the side called the Tip in Inn. Richard was born with one leg slightly shorter than the other, which gave him a walk some regarded as effeminate, and he grew up in a community with a thriving underground culture of gay life and cross-dressing that had a dramatic impact on him. However, Richard, like his parents, was a confirmed church-goer, and his earliest musical inclinations were in gospel, singing in church, and drawing influence from artists such as Sister Rosetta Tharp, Mahalia Jackson, and Brother Joe May. By the time Richard was in junior high, he had learned to play piano and saxophone and developed a reputation in his church for his strong, high-register vocals. In high school, Richard landed a part-time job with a local concert promoter, selling refreshments at the Macon City Auditorium, where he saw some of his gospel favorites as well as R&B stars like Cab Calloway and Lucky Millinder. Richard was 14 when Sister Rosetta Tharp played there. She heard Richard singing early in the day, and invited him to sing a few songs on stage before she began her set. Tharp encouraged Richard to pursue a career in music, and in 1949 he joined the traveling show of an eccentric performer named Dr. Nubio, where he picked up Nubio's enthusiasm for over-the-top performances. Later the same year, Richard hit the road with Dr. Hudson's Medicine Show, which found him performing the Louis Jordan hit Caldonia, and appeared in drag under the stage name Princess Levon. In 1950, Richard landed a gig as a singer with Buster Brown and his orchestra, where the bandleader gave him the nickname Little Richard, based on his lanky frame, and the name stuck. Richard toured on the African-American vaudeville circuit, where he was befriended by Billy Wright, an R&B star who coached Richard in refining his look with pancake makeup, a pencil-thin mustache, and stylish stage wear. Wright also introduced Richard to Zena Sears, a disc jockey with music business connections, leading to Richard signing a record deal with RCA Victor. Richard released four singles with RCA, in 1951 and 1952, but they lacked his trademark energy and failed to find an audience. Thus was the case when he signed with Peacock Records, issuing two singles that quickly came and went, despite Johnny Otis' presence as bandleader on one of the sessions. After his second Peacock single flopped, Richard returned to Macon, where he took a job washing dishes at a bus station diner. There he met a fellow aspiring musician and eccentric known as Askew Reader Jr. or Escarita, depending on the circumstances. Escarita taught Richard his strongly percussive piano style, which had a muscular power and drive that marked the difference between R&B and rock and roll. Escarita helped Richard focus the energy of his performing style, and when Lloyd Price saw Little Richard perform with his new band The Upsetters, Price suggested he contact his label at the time, Specialty Records. Specialty sent Richard to New Orleans to record with producer Robert Bumps Blackwell and engineer Cosimo Matassa, and though his first session initially didn't produce anything of value, during a break he played a raunchy song head written called Tutti Frutti that reflected the hard-rocking sound he learned from Escarita. After cleaning up the lyrics, Specialty released Tutti Frutti in October 1955, and it became an immediate smash, rising to number two on the R&B singles charts and number 29 on the pop survey, despite the fact many stations felt the record was too raucous for the airwaves, preferring to spin a toned-down cover by Pat Boone. Tutti Frutti made Little Richard an overnight star, and between 1956 and 1957, he delivered a string of singles that were R&B and pop hits and cemented his reputation as the wildest man in the rock and roll, including Long Tall Sally, Rip It Up, The Girl Can't Help It, Lucille, and Jenny Jenny. 
Richard would spend decades fighting the penurious recording and publishing contracts he signed with Specialty, but his gig fees made him a wealthy man, and he landed a prime spot in Frank Tashlin's rock and roll comedy film The Girl Can Help It. Relocating to a mansion in Los Angeles and buying a fleet of brightly colored Cadillacs, Richard was living the good life, but that came to a halt in October 1957. While traveling to Australia, Richard experienced the first of several apocalyptic visions that convinced him he needed to turn away from the sinful influences of rock and roll. Within a matter of months, he turned his back on secular music, enrolled in college to study theology, got married, and spearheaded an evangelistic crusade. In 1960, Richard cut a pair of gospel albums for End Records, Pray Along with Little Richard, Volume 1 and Volume 2, and in 1962, Mercury released The King of the Gospel Singers, produced by Quincy Jones. In the fall of 1963, Richard was booked for a tour of the United Kingdom, where his records continued to sell, with Sam Cooke as his co-headliner. On the first night, Richard was upset when fans, expecting to hear him sing his rock and roll hits, booed his gospel set, and he was even more unhappy when Cooke received a major ovation. Richard soon decided to give his fans what they wanted, and for the rest of the tour, he played a selection of his classics that bowled the audience over and stole the show from Cook. The response was strong enough that Richard quickly booked another British tour with the Beatles who were on the cusp of becoming global stars opening the shows. With Richard once again committed to rock and roll, he signed with VJ Records and cut a comeback album, 1964's Little Richard Is Back, which included the R&B hit I Don't Know What You've Got But It's Got Me, as well as Greatest Hits, featuring new recordings of his hits for specialty. A brief relationship with the Columbia-affiliated OK label resulted in 1967's The Explosive Little Richard, produced by Don Covey, which was cut while Jimi Hendrix was a member of Richard's road band. For the most part, these recordings didn't generate many sales, but his frequent touring in North America, the United Kingdom, and Europe helped him enlarge his audience, and as first-era rock and roll came back into vogue in the late 60s, Richard's triumphant appearances at rock and roll revival concerts alongside the likes of Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, and Fats Domino found him filling arenas and topping festival bills once again, as well as headlining showrooms in Las Vegas. Having reaffirmed his status as one of rock and roll's most dynamic artists, Richard signed with Reprise Records, and 1970's The Real Thing gave him his first hit single in years, Freedom Blues. However, two follow-ups 1971's King of Rock and Roll and 1972's The Second Coming didn't find an audience, and Reprise opted not to release a fourth completed album, Southern Child, which finally emerged in 2005 on the box set King of Rock and Roll, the complete Reprise recordings. The 1974 album Right Now was cut in a single night with Bumps Blackwell producing, and received so little promotion most fans hardly noticed it. In 1976, he once again re-recorded his 50s classics for K Telephone Records on an LP called Little Richard Live. While Richard continued to tour regularly, he had developed a severe drinking problem along with regularly abusing cocaine, heroin, and PCP. In 1977, weary from touring and chemical dependence, Little Richard once again renounced rock and roll to embrace evangelism and abandoned secular music in favor of preaching. He cut a gospel album for the word label, 1979's God's Beautiful City, but largely vanished from the mainstream entertainment business. After several years out of the public eye, Richard made a major splash in the media in 1985 with the publication of The Life and Times of Little Richard, The Quasar of Rock, written by Charles White in cooperation with Richard. The book was a wild tale that lived up to any and all legends of his onstage flamboyance and backstage decadence, and it sold well and put him back in the spotlight.
Richard's appearances on the talk show circuit promoting the book led to director Paul Mazursky casting him as a flamboyant record producer in the 1986 comedy Down and Out in Beverly Hills, launching a successful second career with the rocker popping up in movies and television projects well into the 2000s. Richard's track earned enough praise that Disney brought him in to cut a full album for children, 1992's Shake It All About, that went platinum and became one of the biggest selling albums of his career. Richard's future recording efforts were limited to occasional guest appearances on multi-artist projects, but he continued to play live. Health problems began to impact the frequency and intensity of his concerts as he struggled with sciatic nerve pain and underwent a hip replacement. On May 9, 2020, Little Richard died in Tullahoma, Tennessee after struggling with bone cancer. He was 87 years old. 